I'm Miwa Master. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over and Rika Aoki. And I think I just messed up your last name. That's too. okay. Ah, oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it, it's actually Rika Aoki. Although yeah. people do say it, I, you know, whatever. As long as, yeah, as long as the name on the book is me, we're good. Well, there's that. Light from <laughs> Uncommon Stars is our August speculative fiction monthly pick. And we are so excited for a new readership to come to you and Katrina and the queen of hell with a heart, which we're going to get to in a minute and Lon Tran. So thank you, Rika, for joining us on the show. This is so exciting. I'm so happy to see you. But I want to start with something that I read about you in an interview. You were quoting one of your former MFA professors at mm -hmm. Cornell. Mm -hmm. Writing is a public act. Yes. Can we talk about that for a second? Because this is a major, major point for you as a creative. Sure. And, you know, be, and as a public act, I want to thank Barnes & Noble for having me on this wonderful podcast and for uh, the readers who have come to my book. Uh, writing, I've always thought of writing as a public act. Uh, on a personal level, I'm a bit of an introvert and uh, I tend to be the one at the parties when she's not talking about her books or anything, just kind of standing by the club soda and trying not to get horribly drunk and trying to do something with my hands that doesn't look totally awkward. But when I write, uh, that's when I feel I can take part in society. I can contribute to ideas and to teach and to share and to say I love you to, to society, to maybe talk about some of the difficult things in life, but to affirm that these experiences only serve to make life what it is and, and something to be shared, something that's best to be shared. So with my writing, uh, I feel kind of paradoxically that it's a public act. It's a public act for me because I'm usually such a private person. But I do feel my work is something that is there for anybody to read. If you, um, you know, in this book, without going into spoilers, there's space in there and there's music and there's violins and there's Asian things. And, you know, you can talk about queer things because I happen to be queer. But most of it is all about facing a world that we're part of that we might not be able to change and we might not be able to win all the time and we might not be able to get things exactly the way we wish it would be. But that doesn't stop us from loving who we are as we are. And so that's kind of this book and what I like to do with my writing to share my own particular story and maybe join it with yours. So let's set up Light from Uncommon Stars for the readers who may not have experienced it yet. I mean, it was out in hardcover. It's now out in paperback. But this is part of the beauty of a paperback release because I know. more people will come And then this there's book. a beautiful new cover. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's introduce readers to the three women who are really the soul of this book. I have three, three women that are... Um, that I feel whose lives sh would not ordinarily have met. But when I throw them together, they find companionship, they find very unexpected family, and they find very unexpected love, even though they may not even feel they deserve it. So the first character, her name is Shizuka Satomi, and she is an older woman, and she has been a violin player and a violin teacher. Um, and something happened to her where she, she lost her music, at least in her own mind. And she made a deal with the devil. Mm -hmm. And, she, it, and she, regrets, she regrets it immediately and wants to get her soul back. And, and because usually we do have buyer's remorse about things like cars and handbags. Imagine the buyer's remorse you get from selling your soul. And so she makes a rather immoral deal to get her soul back by selling out seven others. Uh, mm -hmm. We shall be avenged sevenfold. She's got six. She took care of six and she's got one more. And who is this going to be? She's just not um, a human trying to get her soul back. She happens to be an artist. 
and she wants to make this last soul sort of her magnum opus. She, she wants to say something with this. And so she doesn't just want to do the assignment. She wants extra credit. And she ends up running into the second character here, whose name is Katrina Wynn. And she's from the East Bay. Uh, she's from one of the sort of more industrial suburbs of, of Oakland, um, probably grew up eating a lot of good seafood, uh, probably mariscos. And she uh, takes, she runs away from home because she is, she's trans. And uh, just from my experience and from a lot of the other experiences that, that I know from other trans people, it's not a great existence. And so she runs away from home to save herself. Uh, she has this dream of playing anime and uh, gaming music on her violin and starting mm -hmm. a YouTube channel and uh, making money that way, which is not an option I had when I was growing up. And I wish I had that. And so she uh, escapes to Los Angeles on a big old Asian bus. The third person in this is, well... Eventually, she's the cook gets hungry and needs donuts. Actually, yes. Actually, without spoiling too much, she has to pee. And so <laughs> um, she meets Lan Tran, who is a Vietnamese space alien mm -hmm. who runs a donut shop and is trying mm -hmm. to and has escaped with her family because there's a galactic war. They're basically refugees, and they they lied and sort of cheated. Not cheated, but they kind of lied their way to escape persecution. Uh, they did what they could, and they scrambled. She's protecting her family. And and really, that's her main thing. She just wants to live a good life with donuts and protect her family because there's war going out there, and she just wants safety, and, and, and she wants the suburbs, and she wants people to come to her donut shop. And so the three of them eventually meet, and they meet each other, and they share. And Lan has a family, has, you know, some children. I'm not going to talk about too much, but they're involved too. These chance encounters uh, are what propels the story forward. What what makes uh, each of the story, each of the characters, question not only their goals but also their limitations, because each of them has sort of limited their dreams of what they want to do, and seeing themselves reflected in each other gives them. Uh, Ideas that maybe they can expect more, they can be more. It is so much fun watching these women figure out their paths and watching them come together as a family. It's really, it's so exciting and hopeful and fun and smart. And even when you get frustrated with them, they are very human. Even the aliens are very human. <laughs> But you also bring them together in a place in the world, the San Gabriel Valley. Oh, yes. Which, for those of us who know the this part of the valley, mm -hmm. it is super Asian American, but it's a mix of Asian American. I mean, Monterey Park is there, and it is a hugely Chinese American community, but mm -hmm. everyone's in the San Gabriel Valley. So let's talk about that for a second, because you grew up there, right? Yes, I did. I went to San Gabriel High School. The San Gabriel Valley used to be... Um, used to belong to indigenous people. It became uh, a Mexican Spanish colony. Um, it, so it had empire. Later, there were German settlers that lived there. And then um, again, always with a strong Latino population. And then later, the Asians came. First, uh, first you know, a lot of Japanese came and Chinese came to work both agriculture and railroad. And then after that, now this is all happening on the same land, you know, mm -hmm. and then, you know, after that, we had um, some Asians from who were, who were refugees from the Vietnam War came mm -hmm. over. So we had people from Laos and Cambodia and uh, Vietnam. We had Thai people coming over, too, during that time, because that war displaced a lot of people that, you know, who they didn't really respect national boundaries. People just came. And then uh, after that, uh, the Chinese American community had uh, had a bit of a a change as the older Chinese who came to work railroad, mostly Taishan, you know, suddenly there was this influx of people from Hong Kong who started to come in. 
because of um, British, you know, giving Hong Kong back to the back to China. A lot of people who lived in Hong Kong left and they came to San Gabriel Valley. And then beyond that, a lot of when the Japanese opened up, more Japanese came in. And then uh, now there's a huge amount of investment from a PRC, from People's Republic of China, that, mm-hmm. that, that's all coming in. And so what you end up getting here is you end up getting a lot of layers. A lot, so it's not simply this is black or this is white. You have layerings. And what makes that San Gabriel Valley so interesting is it's not divided in the same way that, you know, the white people live on the hill and the people of color live down by, you know, on the other side of the tracks. Everyone's kind of mixed in. And so you'll have a business that was once owned by, you know, Latinos that was that that ended up being owned by a Japanese person that got bought out by a, a Chinese person. And then they left and suddenly it's being it's being run by Laotians. And uh, I, I just find that really um, something very special and very magical about the San Gabriel Valley. And I wanted to write about it because I thought it was, it's my hometown. And I didn't want somebody to come in from the outside and write about it without mm-hmm. having a love for the space. I think everyone can understand that, right? We all have our hometown and we all have a certain affection for it. And we, we want to be, you know, we want to be the people writing about it. You know, I would... I tell my I tell my my writing students write about your hometown if you have if you write about your hometown if you want to write about your hometown you write about your hometown before somebody else does it wrong. Well, and that's the thing too. I think there are a lot of folks who don't live in LA or LA County mm-hmm. who think of Southern California solely as Hollywood and Disneyland. Mm-hmm. Like that that's kind of it. And it's like, well, there's a little more happening here. There's I mean. I live not that far from Filipino town when I'm in L.A., so, you know. The nice thing about a city like L.A. is just about when you think you know it, the businesses have all changed and everything's mm-hmm. new again. I tell people that Los Angeles is a great place to live in, but I wouldn't want to visit. Yeah. Uh, you know, okay. I think that people say, you know, I have a week in L.A. How can I take in the city? And I just say... I don't know, stay in one neighborhood and enjoy yourself or <laughs> just turn your mind off and just go from place to place. You're not going to get Los Angeles in a week. You're not going to get Los mm-hmm. Angeles in five years. It's true. Uh, Los Angeles and Los Angeles, unlike uh, New York or San Francisco or Chicago, it's more diffuse. You know, Chinatown is not where you should go for Chinese food. Little Tokyo is not where you should go for sushi. You know, although I do go to Little Tokyo for sushi from time to time, but um, if you want really cool Japanese food, you're in Torrance. If you really want cool, you know, um, Chinese food, you're going into San Gabriel Valley. There's enough of Los Angeles to make people think they know it, but there's a deeper Los Angeles that takes so long to learn. And I think one of the advantages of being in Los Angeles is it's Kind of because I know that trope, it helps me write characters better and stories better because somebody is from Los Angeles or, you know, just any character. I realize there's this layer that can be, we think is there, that can be Mm -hmm. easily defined. And this deeper, more expansive reality that if you really take the time to get to know, it opens up to you. And so I want my stories to be like Los Angeles where... You know, you look at them and you can read them on the surface level and you can have Disneyland and, and you can have the beach and you can have these things. And, and I hope, you know, I hope I write pretty enough that that happens. Mm-hmm. But it's also one where, you know, if you pick up the book later and you go in and you read it more deeply, I, I hope to reward you with a deeper story and deeper characterizations that will um, be very grateful that you took the time out to um, to get to know them. Part of that, too, is the way you write about women and ambition. Shizuka and Lan and Katrina all have dreams and goals and things they want to do. But we don't often talk about women's ambition in a way that isn't sort of desultory or just kind of like, well, ew, why, why would you? We don't always have a grip on ambition. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm dancing around a little bit because obviously I'm trying to avoid spoilers and you know what I'm trying to avoid talking about. But it's wild the way their worlds just kind of 
expand, you know? I think, right. I think with, I don't want to generalize too much because all mm -hmm. women are different. Yeah. But with that being said, I think that most of the women that I know and I talk about and I admire, that's the best mm -hmm. one. Most of the women that I admire, they, there's a, there's a realism to them. They're not going to buy the, I'm going to go to the moon and I'm going to do this and climb Everest and put my flag up. They're kind of more like, sure, I might be climbing Everest, but what are, how many resources am I using up? What, who am I hurting? What am I doing? I think that uh, ambition becomes a much more nuanced thing to have with, uh, with these women that I admire because they realize that um, personal ambition is always balanced by uh, one's, the damage one might do in the world or the repercussions or just the feeling to understand that, sure, I'm climbing Everest, but when I get down from Everest, I have to still wash dishes. You know, the reality that there's no end to the end, where I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of hero fiction that's driven by male writers see ambition, you, you reach this ambition and you win and the story ends. Story doesn't end. Tomorrow mm -hmm. you wake up and you might get into a fight with your with your child and your child is, you know, growing a mustache and it's too early and, and you're mad, you know, just life happens. And so what I wanted to do with this book without spoiling it mm -hmm. is I was thinking to myself, if I can write about space and, and violins and aliens and throw donuts in there and, and, and do all of these things, can I find a way for women in this story, the women in this story to be like the women I admire? to have goals and reach them in their own way while they fully bear the knowledge that women have that it's never over. I'm going to steal a, an image from you. You're talking actually about a violin mm -hmm. and a violin that's being repaired. And you said, what makes a violin special is not its fragility, but its resilience. And these women are really resilient. It takes a little bit of time for them to figure it out, but wow, they are resilient. And it's really wonderful to see as they sort of figure out what's happening. The thing is, there's music in your background, too. You've written music. You're a composer. There's a rock opera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a rock opera. And one of these days, somebody is going to stage it. But, you know, um, that's what I'm hoping. But we'll conquer one world at a time. And, and we'll get to that later. When, you know, it comes to resilience, I think that um, and music. Well, I think with music, music, you, you go from something familiar, you jump into a bridge, literally called a bridge, and, and you bring it back and you play with theme and, and you test the theme, right? You, you, you alter its, its tempo, you just change instrumentations, you pull back, you do so much and it's still the melody. Now, the mm -hmm. interesting thing is, at least I think it's interesting, uh, is that when it comes to the violin, the violin to me uh, was really something that, uh, and the resilience of identity that you mm -hmm. can, um, so without spoiling too much in the book, there's another character who is a, who runs a violin shop. Mm -hmm. And so what is being marveled about with the violin is you can modify the violin quite a bit and it's still the violin. In fact, uh, a, the Stradivarius, if you hear a Strad being played right now, you are hearing an instrument that has been heavily modified. Originally, mm -hmm. strads were set up like early music instruments with, you know, gut strings and low tension. And nowadays, the, the modern violins are set with, you know, steel or uh, gut wound strings or, and, and the, with cores. And, and the fingerboard is pulled back just a little bit. And it's completely, the geometry is completely shifted. But it's still a Stradivarius. And um, it made me think about... So much of, uh, and this is me being very selfish. It made me think about what it meant, what it meant to be trans mm -hmm. and a woman, mm -hmm. and how many modifications we modify our bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's there are sound posts to think about. There are all these other things, and but but identity doesn't come from any of that. Right? Identity doesn't. Your music doesn't. It, you know, your identity comes from the music you make. Knowing that. 
that's not going to solve transphobia. You know, let's be real. Mm -hmm. But internally, if I'm making music that I feel is genuine and authentic to me, then not accepting who I am is not my problem. And, you know, I'll just keep doing the best I can. So the resilience is, and it's kind of my call to trans women. It's like, yeah, people may doubt you by your form, Mm -hmm. but um, you're resilient. There are so many moments of pure joy in this story. And there are moments that involve food. I mean, do not read this book while you are hungry. I (laughs) please just do yourself a favor and have snacks at hand. And it can be donuts. We'll talk about donuts more later. But really, the way you talk about food is so much a part of any piece of Asian American culture. Like food is a thing. Mm -hmm. And there's so much joy around food. There's so much joy around music. I mean, Katrina has some moments when she's playing that are clearly transcendent for her. And it is so much fun to be a part of that as the reader. But we got to talk about joy for a second. Did anything Mm. surprise you while you were writing Light from Uncommon Stars? Because I feel like you knew where we were going, and we're going to come to influences in a second. You knew where we were going. You knew who these women were. But did anything surprise you? I think what really surprised me at the end was um, how the family, especially without spoiling, Mm -hmm. especially the donut shop family, even though they are space aliens, how they come at the end and where, where I leave them at the end was just joyful. I think it ended in a very beautiful, but I think it and they're still an Asian family, right? They still yep. kind of did Asian family <laughs> things. And, um, and I thought that was something that uh, I didn't think would, meet, would matter so much to me when I wrote the book, but that's what the part that made me kind of tear up, you know, where it's like, oh, oh, they get to have this. Oh, okay. We're happy, you know? And the, uh, the other part of joy that I really wanted to do here is uh, I wanted to, a lot of times when you're a woman and you, and you write books, people automatically assume they're going into YA, Mm -hmm. they're going to young adult. And there's a lot of great literature that goes into young adult and YA. Mm -hmm. So I've never taken that as anything, but, you know, thank you. Um, But this book isn't particularly, um, some of the subject matter is not YA. Uh, Right. Some, a lot of it is, you know, um, and if a young adult reads it, great. You know, I have no objections to that. But what I wanted to do, and the reason I think some people are confused is it's got some YA tropes, but I wanted to write a YA novel for older lovers. Mm -hmm. And... That's why um, there is a romance in here, and it's uh, it's between two of the older characters, mm-hmm. and it's a goofy romance, and they they get derpy for each other, and they get awkward, and they have silly misunderstandings, and they feel guilty about it, and they have awkward reconciliations, and they fight over noodles, and uh, but these are the older characters, and mm-hmm. I thought to myself, I wanted to give older readers the joy of fluttering about and crushing on somebody and things like that, because goodness knows in this pandemic, we all need something to flutter about. And one of the things I appreciate too, is just the representation in general. Mm -hmm. You cover a lot of ground with your characters in this book. And you've talked about this in other interviews in in your past, where you've said, you know, these are exactly the kinds of people I needed to see Mm -hmm. when I was growing up. And and your parents had sort of discouraged you from, from being a writer because there's no money in it. But yeah, at no. the same time, and, and you know, immigrant, <laughs> immigrant parents just, they want they us to do like, what they can right, with they, the world they know. Exactly. Just and and they want, yeah, yeah, and they want their kids to succeed and everything else. I did not become a consultant. I became a bookseller. So. <laughs> you know, very, <laughs> we have our paths. Mm-hmm. But I do want to talk about the golden age of science fiction and the influence that that sort of had for you as a writer, because you always identified as a poet first. Mm-hmm. And your cl- you have an MFA. Yes, I do. But you had a moment before you wrote Light from, uh, Light from Uncommon Stars where suddenly science fiction became a part of your literary diet. Mm. Let's call it that. So can we talk about that for a second? How did that really come about? And how did that give you the freedom to stretch a little bit? I mean, you're a poet. Imagery, you can do a lot with words. 
yeah, I lo- and I still like to think that I, I, I do tell my my editor, it's like, I, I, I still write at the speed of a poet, you know, and so can I have another couple of weeks? I grew up really gravitating towards science fiction. So yeah, I was trained as a poet, and that's what my MFA is in. But what I was reading when I was growing up was very, it was all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed science fiction because there was escape. You know, I don't want to get into this too much, but, you know, if you look at some of my essays and, you know, my childhood wasn't always the happiest thing. And when you grow up kind of queer and you don't really have the vocabulary for it, this world seems inadequate to to describe who you mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. And uh, science fiction, it might not have been the world that I wanted, but at least it let me know there were other worlds. And so reading about, reading the people who were published at the time, reading people like Isaac Asimov, reading people, you know, and then, you know, reading people like Doc Smith, E. Doc Smith, reading all of the Star Trek novelizations, the, you mm-hmm. know, all of James Blish's work and uh, Alan Dean Foster's work with the uh, with the animated series. These were all things that I grew up with. And mm-hmm. also with these different uh, books, there were there were more diverse casts. And there were you did have your George Takeys of the world. And you know if you're watching, hi George, I love you. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and all of these things going on. But there were still, and, and up till very recently, there, we'll talk more, but the science fiction world has changed quite a bit. And yeah. I really love that. But uh, when I was writing, I decided, well, wh- what happens if, uh, what if I bring the people that I grew up with into my universe and and mm-hmm. give them the stars and really good donuts and great because I know they play great music you know because I've heard it and I know they make good donuts uh but maybe we can give them the stars maybe I I can um give them my idea of what they might be dreaming about and you know even if I'm not completely right maybe that'll catalyze them to dream uh what and and not just that if I do all of these things Mm -hmm. how does it change what I give the readers how does it change the experience? Who does it let in? Who more can, I, how many people will be able to read this book now and say, hey, I want that? Because, you know, in the, in the end, it's like, as, as beautiful as Star Trek was, if you were trans, you would still probably not be that accepted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't want to fight for a universe like that. You know, I, I wanted to have one where it didn't matter. Or maybe it could be seen as a good thing. Go figure. So with this book, I said, hey, you know, I signed a contract with Tor and I noticed they signed it too. We're going to push this. And Tor, by the way, has been spectacular. Yep. And I, I always, I, I'm just so thankful to them. And uh, what came out was a story that I think people will enjoy. And I've gotten a lot of really good um Great fan mail, great feedback from readers mm-hmm. uh, saying that, yeah, I probably did okay. And I'll continue to do okay, or I'll try. Light from Uncommon Stars is so full of love, and it's so full of unexpected moments, and it's so full of witty banter. You do a lot of witty banter in this book, which is fun. Very fun. But let's talk about some of your literary inspirations that don't come out of sci-fi because you're clearly pulling from a lot of different places. So who are some of the other writers that you love to read? Well, for better or worse, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, um, if you read um, Light from Uncommon Stars, it can seem a little bit shocking at first because I'm switching POVs quite a bit. So this book, I switch points of view quite often. I do this for a lot of reasons because um, I think living as, um, especially living as somebody who's queer or as a person of color, we're switching identities and voices in our head as we we go. You know, I was just talking with you, seeing you know somebody who is Asian and is Japanese. You know, suddenly you know I I want to speak Japanese. I'm trying to filter so I don't you know, speak, and so we're always 
switching voices. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so somebody like, say, um, Virginia Woolf and the Waves, this was a book that was really let me know that I could do this, how she just switched points of view. So Virginia Woolf is an incredibly important, uh, an incredibly important uh, writer to me. Um, and then and the other novelist who really made it feel like it would be possible for a poet to write uh, to write novels was Toni Morrison. Because Toni Morrison, if you read Beloved and you open any page in that book, you'll get a poem. There, the way she uses language is so rich and, and so varied and, and gorgeous. Even when she's talking about horrible, horrible things, that language is just so sensual, so beautiful. And I like to have stars in the sky. And I was thinking to myself, well, I don't think I'm going to get to Toni Morrison anytime soon, which ironically frees me up to try to reach Toni Morrison. When I'm writing this book, I'm thinking of Virginia Woolf. I'm thinking of Toni Morrison. I'm thinking in terms of poetry. I'm thinking of poets, you know, that are very, you know, everything from, um, you know, Amiri Baraka and Etheridge Knight all the way out to um, somebody like Jane Kenyon, you know, where you just the, the beauty in the language. There's like the Hawaiian poets like Julia Connell and mm -hmm. things like that, that, that write about home so beautifully. And I want to sort of bring some of that in. Garrett Hongo. Write a, wrote a poem about the essence of garlic that really made me think about using food. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I pull from a lot of different things. There's also a sansei poet. I, I may not get her name right, but her, I think mm -hmm. it's Amy Uematsu, who mm -hmm. writes just this beautiful, th these beautiful um, just musings on being in Los Angeles. And, she's, you know, she's one generation above me. She's a sansei, I'm a yonsei. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But same, but but all of that, and so all of this together uh, are all um, mentors and people. I am I could not have written this book without. And then, of course, my Cornell crew. I did my MFA at Cornell, so um, mm -hmm. Archie Ammons, A. R. Ammons, the poet, uh, told me a couple beautiful things. You know, he told me once. He said, "If you, through your work, can improve the human condition." even a little bit, you'll be rewarded beyond your wildest dreams. And I thought to myself back then, I'm going to go for that one. I mean, it's not like not improving the human condition was ever an option for me because I'm not her. And so I've been trying with my work through my art, uh, not compromising my art, but through my, through my work to make people's lives a little more worthwhile. And yeah, it's just always been my goal. Ken McLean who really helped me deal with uh, racism in mm -hmm. publishing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he would tell me things that had happened. Uh, he and Amiri Baraka are friends, you know, yeah. and we're, we're talking about what it meant to, to face racism and take advantage of the opportunities that this society had to offer while emerging with most of your soul intact. And so I've had really strong mentors. Uh, Robert Morgan, who's another one of my mm -hmm. uh, mentors, he really made me feel okay for going to the dark side and writing novels. And the funny thing is Bob is, uh, if you read Robert, you know, read, look up Robert Morgan, amazing mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, he was like an Oprah pick, you know? I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, I remember asking him, how does it feel to be one of Oprah's picks and, and being famous? And he just looked at me and he goes, Texas. <laughs> the taxes. But anyway, uh, you know, when I told him that I was, uh, I came out to him as transgender, mm -hmm. he just looked at me and says, well, you've always liked to travel. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and we just continued as normal. Right. And, uh, but he taught me not to be afraid. Yeah. He just said, you're still you. Yeah. you. You're still you. You can still, you can, you're still writing and you're still teaching me. He said that. And it's like, I almost cried. No, I did cry. I did cry. <laughs> yeah, well, you can really write. That much we know. So what's next? I'm writing a sequel, not a sequel, but a spinoff of okay. my next uh, 
of Light from Uncommon Stars. I've touched on with Hemele Ahilo, which is my first novel, yep. and this novel here, um, and Light from Uncommon Stars. I touched on gods and demons and things like that. And so this mm-hmm. next novel is kind of going to be a little bit more about the cosmology, like what is Ooh. going on behind the scenes. Uh, Tor was so generous to give me a uh, free reign to write my next book. And I thought, well, I'm not going to waste this. My first book was for my ancestors. My second book was for my friends. And the third book will be for my dreams. This is the, this is the universe that I wish for all of us. It's also going to be set somewhat in LA, but I'm mm-hmm. also going to bring a little bit more of Japan in there because there are going to be sort of displacements. I don't want to spoil Light from Uncommon Stars. I certainly don't want to, to uncover the next one. And then also, um, you know, if you look me up on Facebook, I write, uh, or on just Twitter, I have RikaWorld at Bulletin.com, my newsletter, if you want to mm-hmm. catch up. Because there's a lot of times where there are things I'm researching that, I, that I'm researching that I'm not going to end up putting in the book, but right. it's still interesting. And it's my way of chatting with people and saying, Thank you. And uh, I'm also going to be by, and then, no, by the time this comes out, Comic-Con's already going to have come and gone. But um, I am a finalist for the Hugo Award. This yes, you next are. book is. So Very if you're exciting. reading this, please vote, <laughs> please vote. I would love to win. Okay. But um, I guess in a nutshell, though, what I'm going mm-hmm. to be doing next is what I always do. Writing my best work, bringing it to readers, saying with as best I can, I hope this makes your life a little more interesting, a little more worthwhile. And I'm incredibly grateful. Before I let you go, can I ask you one more question? Because that Absolutely. So That's what I'm here for. But I have to ask, mm, you yeah. have a favorite donut? <laughs> okay. So my absolute favorite donut in the world that I can't mm-hmm. get, because that's what makes it your favorite, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is a malasada. Mm-hmm. which is a Hawaiian fried donut mm-hmm. in Kohala from mm-hmm. Texas Drive-In. Texas Drive-Ins, Malasadas. Now, I know some people in Hawaii like Leonard's, but they're on Honolulu, and we all know how Honolulu people are. Mm. But the real good ones are actually on the big island, and the ones I like are filled with Bavarian cream. And oh my gosh, you eat that, and you you sit there on the cliffs of Kohala, and you have the, the wind going through your hair and you're smelling the ocean and you're drinking your fruit punch. It doesn't get any better than that. And, and so that's my absolute favorite donut in, in the world. Locally in Los Angeles, though, mm-hmm. uh, the Kindles, the, um, the Texas donut from Kindles mm-hmm. is yep. amazing. <laughs> so look for the big donut that's not Randy's. You're probably at Kindles. Get the Texas donut. Say hi to the Asian lady for me because she's cool. <laughs> And, uh, and that's it, you know, and then, uh, but for you just questioning, you know, it's like you Mm -hmm. come from the land of Dunkin' Donuts. What do you think of the LA donut scene? It's deeply impressive. It is. It is. I just, I happen to be a fan of the, you know, coconut flake cake donut from Dunkin'. I, I, Mm -hmm. I'm very, very Have you tried mochi nuts here? Yes. Yes. Those are fun. They're not quite donuts in the same way, but I thought, you know. That's like donuts I, at 100% Asian. <laughs> well, and I love rice flour. No, I mean, I baked treats with rice flour are really fun. It's just when I think of donuts, I really do think of like very old school Dunkin' Donuts. No, when I was in Boston and I mm-hmm. had my Dunkin' Donut, you know, with my with my hot cup of coffee and my yeah. Dunkin' Donut. Oh, no, no, no. I, there's, I, I get it. I completely get it. That, that's, that's about as classic as they come. Well, I'm really looking forward to having a donut with you someday. We'll figure Absolutely. out how to make it. Let's figure out how to make it. And then you just um, really want to thank, yeah, really, I know this is, you know, for the Barnes & Noble podcast, but I just mm-hmm. want to thank everybody. And I'll make sure if I'm ever in town to stop in that Barnes & Noble and say hello. Yes, please. You Will know, do. We, we've got stores in lots of different places. Okay. Rika, 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 I okay. Please tell me I got it finally right, but I think I ah, okay. Mm-hmm. I okay. Sorry, you know my Boston comes flying out, and my Japanese gets scrambled when my Boston comes <laughs> flying out. So I'm going to apologize that for. But my sister, this was so really fun to have you on the show. Thank you oh so gosh. much for making the time. I really enjoyed this too. Um, thank you for doing this, and thank you just for everything this podcast is doing to like help writers talk to readers and, and to to meet people. It can be a bit of a lonely job kind of be out here typing and um, to be able to get out here, talk about my work and to say thank you means everything to me. So thank you.
Well, lady, you're stuck with us, so we're just waiting for the next book. <laughs> All the best, and you know, everybody stay healthy, and if you're sick, I hope you get better soon. Thank you, thank you. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off, where we recommend books for you to pick up when you come in for your copy of Light from Uncommon Stars. I'm Becky, coming to you from my home store in Westchester, Ohio, and I am joined, as always, by my book buddy, Mark, hello. <laughs> so, Mark, I'm actually going to get started, if that's all right with you. That sounds fantastic. I think you've got a very good one. I do. It's actually a book that you recommended to me, uh, and I uh, I picked this book up, and I just never wanted to put it down. It is House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. Ah, uh, And yes. it is fun. Uh, all of the warm feels. It's yes. so good. This is basically a Pixar version of Umbrella Academy, I feel like, yeah. uh, would be the best way to describe it. Basically, it follows Linus Baker, who is a quiet man living a very solitary life. Uh, he is a caseworker for the department in charge of magical youth. And basically, he, he checks in on magical children uh, that are in government-sanctioned orphanages around the country. And um, he, one day, out of his quiet life, he is summoned to extremely upper management. And this is a big deal. Mm. This is a little scary. Because he is just, a, he's a rule follower. He just, he does what he is supposed to do. He very much believes in the system and what he is working on. So he is summoned up there and given a top secret job of going to an island orphanage that is run by Arthur Parnassus. And so he goes just, again, following the rules, just doing what he's told. But when he gets there, it's a very different feel than anything else he's ever experienced. And this orphanage is exclusively full of magical children. So we've got a gnome, a sprite, um, a green blob, and the Antichrist. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, just a typical day. So he is... Um, He's there, again, just he thinks that he's there just to take notes, you know, see how things are running, and then give his report. But there's definitely more at play. Yes. So um, it's just, oh, gosh, it's a warm hug of a book. Yes. I, I love this so much. And really what it talks about is discovering a family you didn't even know that you needed and that you would be welcomed into. Um, just, we all have, we all have that group of people, whether it's the people we're born into and that family we were given or that family that we find. Um, this is just, uh, such a sweetheart of a book. So I just highly recommend it really. If you just want a warm cup of tea, kind of a, of a book, that's what this is. It's just so hopeful and wholesome. It is House in the Australian Sea by T.J. Klune. What do you have for us, Mark? <laughs> Such a good pick. And if you guys get a chance, please go through our backlog and listen to the TJ Klum episode yes. of Porta Over. It is tremendous. Oh. He's so great. So I have one that also has some silliness mm. um, and some whimsy attached to some uh, grander themes. And um, I chose the book Blackwater Sister by Zen Cho. Mm. Um, I am going to just read a tweet from the author who was uh, who tweeted this when she was describing the book. It is, a stressed zillennial lesbian fights gods, ghosts, gangsters, and grandmas in 21st century Penang. I mean, <laughs> yes, please. That's, yeah. Okay, Love I am it. on board. Sign me up. Yep. So uh, the book is wild and fun. Uh, it follows Jess, who is getting ready to move back home to Malaysia. And she begins hearing voices. And these voices are actually uh, her grandmother, who has recently passed, and who it was a very powerful medium. She is using Jess as a conduit for a very powerful deity called the Blackwater Sister. She's also using Jess as a weapon against some crime lords who have offended and wronged this deity. Uh, yeah, the book is fast paced. It is delightfully bizarre, but it also has a lot of wonderful themes about heritage, about queerness, culture shock, and owning up to and discovering your power. Uh, and then what you do with it once you find it. It's a blast. Uh, I really recommend it. Uh, please check out Blackwater Sister by Zen Cho. Okay. I think that is all so. we've got today. <laughs> Thank you all so much for tuning in to Port Over. 
um, please make sure to support us with a rating and hit that button and subscribe yes. so you never miss an episode. Uh, you can also follow us at Barnes & Noble. My name is Mark. My name is Becky. You can follow our home store at BN Westchester. Thanks so much for joining us today. Happy reading. Bye. Bye. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.